Well, once again, I'm hawking my books around. Uh, so, just to mention again, God's, what's it called? Treasured Possession. <laughs> I, you know, I changed the title. When I was writing it, I called it God's Special Treasure. And, uh, and then I, I thought, no, I'll change it to God's Treasured Possession. And I can never remember what I finished with. <laughs> but there it is, God's Treasured Possession. Uh, it's on the table again. Last opportunity, there you go. Christmas is coming, how about that for a present? And um, the Spirit Filled Church is another title that's there. It's very relevant from what we're looking at both last week and this week. The Spirit Filled Church. You'll find, I think, really helpful chapters in there on the table. And uh, like last week, if you don't have cash, there are facilities for using uh, the credit card. Okay, so I'm going to speak to you from, we start off at least from Acts chapter 1. I'll read you a few verses in Acts chapter 1. And then we'll get down to uh, what I promised I'd speak about last week, namely the coming of the Spirit upon the church. As Ollie said at the beginning, we, we talked about he's not leaving us orphans. You remember that number of guys who've been living with Jesus for three years, that incredible experience of being around Jesus and understanding as time went by, they, they more and more understood, you know, this isn't just an amazing teacher. He's not some kind of miracle worker. I mean, and he not only walks on a storm, he just says, shush, and it stops. And he turns water into wine, and he touches lepers and makes them whole. And he says amazing things, and he shows mercy and kindness. And it's like breathtaking to be around him every day, the, the excitement of being around Jesus. Uh, and then this terrible word, I won't be with you much longer. And the horror of that, I can't imagine what that would be like for Simon Peter, who'd left his nets, left his past, forget that, I've given up fishing, I want to be with him. And then he's going away? You're going away? What? You're going away? And that's why I won't leave you orphans. Ah, he's coming back. Thank like, God, he's coming back. And what did that mean? Well, on the day of Pentecost, he came back. And beloved, that's our experience. If it, if it isn't, we're falling short. As we said last week, it's not, Christians are not people trying to remember what it was like when God visited us for a little while. That would be so sad and so ridiculous to think the great plan of salvation that got more and more wonderful, more and more wonderful, God then comes in Jesus and then he goes. No, no, the whole idea was that it was opening up to the Spirit. He's been with you, he will be in you. This is the great thing, this is the ultimate God with us. And it's been so great this morning just to feel the excitement as we've been extolling God and seeing how great is our God. And we've got our own testimonies. It was great last week to hear so many who came to the mic and said, thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for that. We experience him in our lives. And if you're our guest here this morning, this is not your normal place to be on a Sunday, but someone's invited you to come. Hey, we're talking about a God that we know. He's in our lives. He speaks to us. He makes himself known to us. We're enjoying God. So let me just read to you. Acts chapter 1. I'll just read a few verses from verse 4. Acts chapter 1 verse 4. Gathering them together, Jesus commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. When they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence with us. Thank you for, Lord, singing these wonderful songs, reminding us of your greatness, your majesty, your power. Thank you for this great reminder, Lord, that everything's wiped out, Lord. You've, you're building a new house. You're making us a new creation. We're so grateful, Father. And the Holy Spirit, we 
We invite you now, please lead us into truth. Please, Lord, take your word, make it live to our hearts, inspire confidence and faith. Meet with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So Jesus made these extraordinary words. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, as Jewish guys, these disciples would not have found that a strange thing. What do you mean? It was an unusual idea. Where did you get that idea from? No, 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 they knew their Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you'll find frequent references to the Spirit coming upon people and actually transforming them. You find out a scared guy called Gideon who's hiding in a cave because, well, the Midianites are so powerful. And it says the Spirit came upon him. And he became a great warrior. He led a tiny army against a huge army and was completely victorious. He was transformed by the Spirit coming upon him. We find that Samuel anointed David with oil and from that time the Spirit came upon him. He became a powerful guy. We find that repeatedly in the Old Testament. You find sometimes at a kind of handover time when Elijah had been the national prophet and he's to be replaced by Elisha. And Elisha says, I can't do this without the spirit that's been on you. And you get that story of Elijah, Elijah saying, well, I'm, it's nearly all over. He said, no, you mustn't go. I must have the spirit that was on you. I've got to have it. And we get that story of how the spirit came upon Elisha. And he carries on a ministry that is just as dynamic as Elijah has been. Elijah's been breathtaking. Then Elisha becomes breathtaking. That same spirit is on him. You find that Moses is instructed, lay hands on Joshua, that the spirits on you might come on Joshua. Interesting, another one you find is that at one point Moses is a bit kind of overwhelmed with the task of leading two million people through the desert. He says, Lord, help, help. This is a big task. And God says, all right, gather 70 guys. So he gathers 70 guys at the meeting house, the place where God met, the tent of meeting. And he said, I'll take some of the spirit that's on you and put it on the 70. And you find that story in the Old Testament. And so they, they come to the place and the spirit comes upon these 70. And they all start prophesying. There's this clear deposit, this empowering that goes upon them. So it's something that's quite kind of common in the Old Testament, this coming upon of the Spirit. Sometimes, as Moses laid hands on Joshua, sometimes a laying on of hands. Another time when Elijah said to Elisha, if you see me going, you'll know the Spirit's come upon you. It's a fascinating one, that. We'll come back to that a bit. If you see me going. And he sees him going. He said, well, he said, if I saw him. And so he rips up his own clothes and he picks up the garment that Elijah had dropped and Elijah just opened up the Jordan, just come through, opened the Jordan, they walked through. And so he, says, he said, if I saw him go, he said, if I saw him go, right, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And he strikes and it opens. It's like, he's, that's what he said. I believe him, I receive, I receive. It's a kind of real faith step. There's not a lot of kind of anything else, but he said it, he said it. So I'm going to go on what he said. I'm going to trust what he said and believe him. And that spirit was on him, mighty. Wow. And by devotional reading, I read right through the Bible, and I've just come to these stories of Elisha, incredible things he did, amazing. Empowered by the spirit in another dimension. So Jesus has done this phenomenal ministry because when he was baptized in water, the spirit came upon Jesus. And he said, the, sp the spirit of the Lord's upon me. He's anointed me to do these amazing things. Luke chapter four, he quotes that verse from the Old Testament. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus received the spirit and served in the power of the spirit. And now he's saying to them, now you will receive power, All right? So for these guys, it's not like, what on earth does that mean? They know their Bibles. They know about guys whose lives have been transformed when the spirit came upon them. And so they wait. And we know the story. They waited, and then on what we call, or at least what they call, the day of Pentecost, which was a Jewish feast day, the Jewish feast day which represented the giving of the law and kind of harvest festival. We're both wrapped up in that, that feast, that celebration, the giving of the law. It's going to be given a new way now in their hearts. 
and a great harvest was going to come that day. The Spirit fell upon these 120 in the upper room. And they fell with the Spirit and all started speaking in new languages. They spill out into the open air. And listen, don't think that the languages were given for preaching. They weren't. They were speaking in tongues upstairs. We don't know how they moved from there to there. But somehow they moved from the upper room where the glory came out into the street. Somehow, we don't know how they got from there to there, but they, I guess, burst out full of excitement. And they say, they're, here, they're speaking the wonderful works of God. I can hear them in my language. I can hear, he's speaking my language. He's speaking my language. They're speaking, but they're not convicted by preaching. They hear them speaking the wonderful works of God. They're kind of they're worshiping God. And then Peter, in a common language to all of them, preaches. And when he preaches, they're not saying, oh, wonderful. They're saying, oh, what must we do? Because he's preaching now. A language they all understand. And 3,000 get saved. So these tongues, they're just worshipping, praising in languages they'd never learned. That's what happened on that day of Pentecost. Now, for us, it's like, so where do we fit in? I know as a, as a young Christian, I, I, I was very backslidden when I first got saved. I came out of a non-Christian background, and my parents were not Christian. And I knew nothing at all. But I, I got saved. I, I received, I was witness to, I received that, and I, I got saved. I was terribly backslidden for about four years. And then one Sunday, everything changed for me. I was arrested by a preach. I felt God said, I want your life. I want it now. And I, I, I mean, for the first time... I thought, oh God, it's God speaking to me. It was, it was scary and exciting at the same time. As far as I knew how I gave myself to God. And I tried to live the Christian life. And I, I, I tried quite hard. I was, I was working in the church. And when I say working, I was involved in church life. And I got involved. But I was very aware that I was a terrible witness. And so I, I would even lead little Bible studies in the church, but outside the church, I was a useless witness. I, I missed so many opportunities to witness. And it really began to get to me. I thought, no, I want to be a witness. A friend of mine said, I'm going door to door. Would you like to come with me? I said, no, thank you. I, I don't do that. I don't talk about Jesus. I was terribly concerned about it. And I, and I began to think, is there more? And then my, my Baptist pastor, he preached once and he said, are you like Peter before or after Pentecost? And I thought, well, you don't need to apply that much. Because Peter before Pentecost said, no, I'm not with him. I don't know him. But after Pentecost, he stood up and boldly preached. And he was transformed. When the Spirit came upon him, you'll be witnesses. I thought, that's what I want. I want that so much. And I began to pray about it and pray about it. And I just kind of got confused because there seemed to be different voices. People I respected, great Bible teachers. And some Bible teachers said, to be honest, there isn't more. You, you know, you just become a Christian and that's it. And, and, and you'll grow. Of course you'll grow. But there's not, there's, you know, this experience of the Spirit coming upon them, that's, that, you don't, that's not relevant today. And then other Bible preachers, I mean, the great John Stott would say that. And he was a huge hero. I thought, John Stott says that, well, okay. Then the great Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was also a great hero of mine, he said, go after the Spirit, seek God for the Spirit. I thought, oh my, these two don't agree. What chance is there? I'll work it out. I'll just, oh, if they don't agree, there's no hope for me, I'll never work it out. And I kind of gave up and just got on. And, and, and yet I had this longing for more. And for me, it, it, turned one, it turned one day. I was, I, was, uh, I was going to church. I went to church in the morning. I did a little Bible study group early afternoon. Then you went to the evening. In those days, you went to church morning and evening. As a good Baptist, that's what I did. And uh, I did that. I mean, I did it with joy. I was happy to do it. Uh, but I had a gap. And I had like two hours to kill. Late afternoon to the evening meeting. So it was a sunny summer's day. I lived in Brighton and I, I thought, oh, I'll walk along the seafront. I walked along the seafront just to kill some time. And I'm getting out towards what they call the fish market in Brighton. We've got an upstairs uh, a promenade and a downstairs promenade. And as I'm getting closer, I can see there's quite a crowd of people around there. So I walk along, think, well, what's, this, what's going on? And then as I get closer, I see what's going on. And there's some very elderly ladies 
on the lower promenade holding up banners saying, repent, the end is near, and so on. And, and, and they're singing and, and kind of preaching in ever such frail voices. And to be honest, it's ooh, not very good. And, uh, and people are throwing apple cores at them and cigarette packets and... And I thought, oh, God, this, is, this isn't good. I thought, Lord, why does it have to be so bad? And I felt God said, I'd call young men to do this. How about you? I thought, never will get that. I won't do that, not in my life. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. And there's two guys standing in front of me. I remember it still so vividly. One said to the other, look at those old fools. Why don't they keep their religion in their church? And I mean, he's right there. And it's like, well, you may not be called to preach in the open air, but own me, speak, say something. But I couldn't. Again, I couldn't. And that, for me, that was it. I've got to get, I've got to get an answer. I'm desperate. Desperate. And I need to get through. I've got to find a way through. I went, I went home and I got before God. Lord, please help me. And uh, I, I, I used to lunch sometimes with a guy who was a friend of a mutual friend. I didn't know him terribly well, but we had occasional lunches in London. I used to work in London, commute every day. And uh, I, I called him on the Monday. I said, uh, can I see you? Sure. Why, why did I want to see him? Well, he was so different to me. Because every time we had lunch, if I was a bit late, he's already witnessing to somebody. And I used to love it and hate it. I used to think, well, I wish I could. Well, she wouldn't do that. I feel so embarrassed. But I thought, I wish I was that free, or to be free. And I said, what is it with you? He said, well, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. I said, what is that? He said, come to mind that church next week, and we'll lay hands on you. I said, great, I'll do that. I'll come back to that story later on. But here we see these guys who've been with Jesus for three years, and they're waiting because there's going to be some power given. Now, it's difficult or to see it clearly. Why do, why do people get confused? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. I hope I can explain. Everything I say, I'm going to get out of the Bible for this. First of all, I say this. The Gospels all point forward. They always say things like, this will come. The Spirit is going to come. When he comes, wait till he comes. The Gospels all talk about forward, when the Spirit comes. The epistles, the letters, are written later by Peter, James, John, and so on, they all look back. They take the, they, they, it, the epistles don't tell anybody to be baptized. You won't, look, you won't find a command in any of the epistles to be baptized. Why? Well, because it's already happened. These are Christians. And so the epistles are written to people who've already been baptized. And so the epistles don't tell anybody to get baptized, nor do they tell people to get filled with the Spirit. Why? Because they've already been filled with the Spirit. So the Gospels are saying it's coming. The Epistles are saying it's happened. So how do we find out what happened? The book of Acts. The book of Acts. That's what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says. You have to find out by looking at the book of Acts to see what actually happened. Now, if you look only at the day of Pentecost, you don't see such a very helpful example because of this. The guys who were waiting on the day of Pentecost had been followers of Jesus before the cross, before the resurrection, before the outpouring of the Spirit. You know, you know they're following Jesus, but Jesus hasn't died for their sins yet. yet. I mean, it's difficult to line up with them. But if we look at what happened to people who became Christians when all these things had already happened we'll see a pattern. All right? So I wanted to show you, I'm just going to take you a quick tour, as it were. Acts chapter 8. Here's what happened in Acts chapter 8. We'll make reference to Acts chapter 2, but we're very familiar with it. The Spirit fell, and they spoke in tongues and so on. But Acts chapter 8, it says this, that Philip, who was an evangelist, went to a place called Samaria and preached the gospel. And we read in the passage, when Philip preached, in verse 12 of Acts 8, when Philip preached the good news about the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. All right, so Philip the evangelist is having a very successful evangelistic crusade. 
and people are responding to what he says and being baptized. In other words, they have become Christians. It's quite explicit. They have become Christians. Then it says, verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They'd simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, so their testimony, if one of them to stand up on the platform here and give their testimony, I was saved when I heard the gospel through Philip. I got baptized. I became a Christian. Then a few days later, Peter and John came up and they laid hands on us and the Spirit came upon us a few days later. And so those who say that, well, we'll come back to that. There's a pattern here. A few days later, hands laid on and the Spirit came upon. Then, uh, if you turn over the page, Acts chapter 9, you'll find that the Apostle Paul, most famous conversion story in the Bible, probably the most famous conversion story anyway. Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, hostile to Christianity, wanted to put Christians in prison, and you know what happened, he saw a light. Later on he testified, the God who commanded light to shine in the darkness shone in our hearts to give us the light of the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's born again. He gets a revelation of Christ, the God who commanded light to shine in darkness. That's creation language. He's now a new creation. He's a, he, he shone into my heart. Give me the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's got born again. Three days later, a guy called Ananias, who is not a famous apostle. We don't know who Ananias was. He's not referred to before or after this story. Ananias comes and says to him, at God's instruction, he lays hands on him and says, Brother Saul, okay, he's a Christian brother now. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me that you may regain your sight. We all know that. But did we notice this? And be filled with the Holy Spirit. He lays hands on the Apostle Paul to receive the Holy Spirit. How did the Apostle Paul receive the Spirit? Through the laying on of hands of Ananias three days after his conversion. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Now, there's no reference to speaking in tongues. It does say later in Corinthians, I speak in tongues more than all of you. I do it more than all of you. So Paul spoke in tongues more than all the Corinthians. It doesn't say it did then. We don't know if he did it or not. It just doesn't say. Then one more I'm going to show you. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, that's a very interesting one. Acts chapter 19, you'll find here Paul arrives at Ephesus. He finds, it says in verse 1, Acts 19 verse 1, he found some disciples. Now the word disciple usually means Christian. Although it is used in other ways. It's, there are disciples of the Pharisees, you'll find in the New Testament. There are disciples of John the Baptist. There are, but they, they, it looks like they're Christians. That's what it looks like it's saying. Right, verse 1, it looks like they're Christians. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we've not even heard there's a Holy Spirit. He said, into what then were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. Oh, oh, John's baptism. What was that? Well, it's John the Baptist. And it says all Judea went out to hear John the Baptist. So he had a massive Jewish revival, if you like, of, of repentance. And what was his message? Get ready. That was his message, wasn't it? Prepare the way of the Lord. His message was the message of repentance. Turn away from sin. Get ready. God's coming soon. That was John the Baptist's message. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, he said, but he didn't himself bring that. So these guys were, to his surprise, actually disciples of John the Baptist. They're not, they're not Christians, it turns out. He thought they were, they're not. And so he tells them, 
verse 4, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after them, after him. That is Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. In other words, Paul preached the gospel as we would understand it to them. They now receive the gospel and are baptized. They've now become Christians. Then, verse 6, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And so you get the Samaritan experience but squeezed into one day. They're brought to Jesus and then it's almost like they're still dripping with baptismal water. He lays hands on them and the Spirit comes upon them. Okay, so we'll see some common features here. First of all, a lot of people that we've referred to would have to say, I was saved through the preaching of Christ. Subsequently, someone laid hands on me and I received the Spirit. It was a subsequent experience for the Samaritans a few days later. However long it took for the news to get to Jerusalem and for them to walk from Jerusalem there, a few days later, they laid hands on and they received the Holy Spirit. For the Apostle Paul, if you read the whole text, three days later, after he'd been converted, hands were laid on him. Here, Acts 19 a few minutes later, a few minutes later, having been brought to Christ, hands were laid upon them and the Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. All right, so that would be the certain common features there. And so the teaching that says, no, I've received, you've received everything at conversion, that would be quite common teaching by some evangelical brothers who love the Bible, who love Jesus. But that would be their teaching. You've received everything. And then they would say this. You gradually get filled with the Spirit. It's a lifelong journey. You gradually get filled with the Spirit. You, you know, you, you've received everything, but you gradually get filled. That's, what, that's the sort of thing they would say. But let me just bring this Bible verse to you. When Paul said to them, have you received the Spirit in Acts 19? They said, nope. After he'd laid hands on them and they're speaking in tongues and prophesying, if he'd said to them, have you received the Spirit now? I think they'd have said, yeah. <laughs> I don't think they'd have said, well, we're gradually moving on to that. I'll say, you know, that, there is obviously growth in God. Our, our Christian life is, is one of, pro, it's a process. We keep on growing. We keep growing in grace, growing in the knowledge of God. Of course there is growth. But the coming upon of the Spirit it's something that happened. It's not like, you know, it's not like a soldier saying, a, a captain or general saying to his men, go and fight. And if you do really well, I'll give you guns next time. You know. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is not a reward for having done well. It's a gift for weak people. It's not for special Christians, it's for crummy Christians. Like Simon Peter who said, no, I don't know him. I'm not with him. Never, no, I've never seen him before. You think, is, is he ready? He's ready. Boy, is he ready. He needs the Holy Spirit. See, some of us, because I've been around a while, some of us say, I don't know if I'm worthy. <laughs> worthy? How long are you going to wait to get worthy? How long are you going to wait to get worthy? I don't think I'm worthy. Of course you're not worthy. Of course you're not worthy. You're useless. Like I was useless. Like Simon Peter was useless. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. We don't get disqualified because, well, I'm not a very good Christian. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. See, the devil is so cunning. He kind of says to you, oh, you don't, it's not for you. You're not good enough. It's, it's, for, it's for not good enough Christians. Especially. Especially. Pete, Jesus said, don't even start till you receive. Don't even start. So this, this was the common, this is the book of Acts, what it says repeatedly. They laid hands on people, the Spirit came upon them. It was that dimension that happened to them. They were, they were empowered. That's what God was speaking to them about. It's something that happened to them, and, you, and often, not always, but often 
through the laying of hands. If you read Acts chapter 10, when Peter is preaching in Cornelius' home, and this reluctant Jewish guy, Peter, is told to go to this Gentile centurion, the hated Romans, and tell them about the gospel. And Peter goes a bit scared. And he preaches the gospel, and the Spirit falls upon them all. And they all start speaking in tongues. And he says, you've got the same Spirit as we have. It's all very free. It's all very free. He didn't even get a chance to lay hands on them. You know, the wind blows where he wills, right? So I'm trying to give you some principles, which I think are valid. But in the end, you can't tie the Holy Spirit down. You'll hear stories, amazing stories, of how the Spirit came. And he's God. He can do what he likes. But there are principles we can follow. And so here we see, yeah, the coming of the Spirit. So Jesus said to the apostles, wait. Wait until the power comes. Now when I was originally searching, I thought, there were some who say, there isn't anything. Some who say, seek it. Some who say, wait. But that's one of the reasons I think, I think some people get tied into the day of Pentecost. Pentecostals tend to get tied into the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, they were told to wait. And they sometimes have what used to be called, I don't know if they still are, tarrying meetings where you wait to see. You just wait. But it's interesting. After the day of Pentecost, no one was ever told to wait again. See, that's simply true. That's why if you look at the whole, that's why I'm trying to bring the whole of Scripture to bear. No one was told to wait again. When Peter and John came down to Samaria, and there's these people, they're followers of Jesus now, they're Christians, they've been baptized by Philip, they didn't say, hey, you better wait, there's more. They just laid hands on them. The Spirit came on. When Paul went to Ananias, Ananias went to Paul, he didn't say to Paul, hey, you're going to be an apostle, you better find an upper room somewhere. You better wait. Now, an unknown Ananias laid hands on him. The Spirit came on him. Acts 19. These guys are still dripping with baptismal water. There's no suggestion, you better wait. They just lay hands on them. They just become Christians. They lay hands on them straight away. No one's told to wait. It comes straight away. So why did Jesus say wait? And from then on, no one waited. After the day of Pentecost. Why? Why? Well, let me take you to the last Bible verse I'm going to speak to you about. John chapter 7, which I think sheds loads of light on this. John chapter 7 is a wonderful passage where on the last day, the great day of the feast, it was a feast day when they remembered the journey through the wilderness and the supernatural way in which God provided water for them. And on the last day, the great day, the priests would pour out water visibly, publicly, as a display, a reminder of God's provision. And on that day, the great day, Peter pushed, I mean, Jesus pushed through the crowd and shouted out, if anyone's thirsty, come to me and drink. Wow. (laughs) Come to me and drink. He that believes in me. Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. But, it says, the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So it says, come and drink. Yes, please. Oh, well, not yet. What? You said come and drink. Yeah, but not yet. That's what it says. If anyone's thirsty, come to me and drink. Yes, please. Well, um, not yet. Well, because I'm not worthy, nothing to do with you, I'm not yet glorified. I'm not yet glorified. That's why you have to wait. When he was glorified, when he ascended on high, when he was glorified, the Spirit came. And Peter said on the day of Pentecost, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised up, whereof we're witnesses. He now, exalted by the right hand of the Father, glorified, has shed forth this. They're all filled of the Holy Spirit because it has happened now. He's being glorified. The Spirit's available. Today, this morning, 
It was available to these new Christians now, available now. I remember when I was preaching once at Hove Town Hall. We used to meet there on a Sunday morning sometimes in the church we met. And the, 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 I had the great joy and privilege of leading a student girl to Christ at the end of the meeting. And uh, then the guy starts rattling the keys. She wants to get out of here. And we're all moving. And she said to me, is there more? And I said, well, actually there is. But why do you ask? She said, there's power in this meeting. I was so fascinated. She said, there's power. There's power in this meeting. Is there more? So I said, yeah, come. I gave her my address. Come to my home next Saturday. And we'll tell you about it. So she came to my home the next Saturday. And she brought with her her roommate from college. And she said, oh, this is my friend. Her name was Suraji, an Indian girl. My, and she said, and Suraji said to me, Celia is so changed since last Sunday. She says it's because she's become a Christian. I'd like to become a Christian. So I said, wow, wonderful. So well, I opened the scriptures with her and talked with her. And, and then we prayed and said, wow, thank you so much. To shed some tears. Wow, Christians are wonderful. And Celia said, don't forget what I came for. I want to know about this. What more is there? What more is there? So I then took her through the scriptures about the laying on of hands, the receiving of the Spirit, speaking in tongues, and so on. She said, great, 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 great. Right, can we pray then? Then Suraji, who'd been saved like 20 minutes, said, what about me? Can I have that as well? Well, with Acts 19 open, you don't say, uh, yeah, you must do that later. Well, no, of course you can. Of course you can. So one's been saved a week. The other's been saved 20 minutes. I laid hands on both of them. They both got filled with the Spirit, both started speaking in tongues with all their hearts and went on their way very happy. They didn't have to earn it. They didn't have to be special Christians. See, beloved, I'm trying to help you. You don't have to be special. They'd just been saved a week and 20 minutes and it's received. It's available. So can I just go back to my own story? I said, I, I went to my friend and said, can you help me? He said, yeah, come to my church next Sunday. So I went to his church the next Sunday. And he said, you're lucky. There's this, this well-known American preacher here. And he, he'll pray for you. So I thought, oh, great. Got the big guy. So I'm in, I'm in the room there. And there's uh, maybe, I don't know, a dozen, 20 of us in the room. And this big guy goes, praise him. I think, man, I'm alive. Here comes the man. And he goes around, prays for them. Pray. And he came to me. I thought, here comes the man. Here comes the man. And he laid hands on me and he prayed. Guess what I felt? Hands on my head. That's what I felt. <laughs> and then he went on. I thought, what was that then? What, what was that all about? I've come to London. What was that? And they said, well, praise God. I said, what do you mean, praise God? He said, well, you know, you came, we prayed. I said, oh, oh. I didn't feel anything. And, and the... Now the big guy's gone. He went around the circle and went. I'm about the worst person who was ever prayed for. I said, well, what was that all about then? They said, well, look. And then my friends who are contemporaries of mine, we, we were all, I think we would have been 20, 22 in the room. They said, no, come on, look. And they just started opening scriptures with me. And they said, let us pray with you. So they prayed with me. They said, look, here, this verse, this verse, this verse, you know, like I've tried to do. I said, no, come on, let's just pray together. And so they prayed for me and prayed. And then they said, well, how did I come with you? Thank God, thank God. I said, okay, I thank God, thank you, Lord. They said, no, speak in tongues. I said, come on. No, just do it, just do it. How do you, well, just do it. There's no, you just do it. So I thought, oh, boy, I don't know about this. So, and I, I began to speak. And I stopped because like a thousand voices are saying, you're just making that up. You're making that up. And I'm making it. So I thought, no, no, no. I, don't, I didn't come to London to fool around. I want something authentic. So I stopped. So they said, come on. They took me back again. Come on. Just do it again. Just start. Come on. And actually, I did. When I went, I believed God was going to meet with me. So I had this kind of, I wasn't going to let go because I, I really felt God promised me he was going to meet with me. So although I was having a hard time, I needed a midwife, I was having a hard time. They, they said, come on. And so I began again. 
I began to speak in tongues. I began to speak in tongues. And I just carried on doing it. And then my friend's fiance said, you're very clever making all this up. And I laughed. We all laughed. And some of the tension went out of the room. And I carried on. And as I carried on, I felt this kind of, whoa, go through me. And I thought, Abba, Father. And I've never known God that close. I've been a Christian for probably six years. But I've never known God that close before. I've never found him that near. I thought, man, this is wonderful. And, and although at the beginning I thought, I'm just making this up, they then went to an evening meeting. That's what followed. That's what's going to happen, the evening public meeting. And the, the congregation of the church was quite a big building. They all sat near the front. And I went right to the back and sat in a row alone, put my hand over my face and spoke in tongues for probably two hours. I just, I oh, didn't want to stop. Just carried on, carried on, carried on. And I'm so grateful for the sense of God's great, great nearness. Amazing. And a few weeks later, I was, I was back at home in my Baptist church. I've been praying, Lord, how do I get to share? I want to share this, but I, I don't want to mess up the church. I want to make trouble. But, you know, this is so wonderful. I want to share. And I didn't know I was praying about it for a few weeks. Lord, how do I, tell, how do I share this? I want to share this. And then we went away. We went to Eastbourne. I never thought of that until this moment. We came to Eastbourne to a hotel somewhere, which we used to do every year. And the guys in their kind of early 20s, late teens, early 20s, we came away with the pastor and um, did this weekend house party thingy. And, it, and the program, Saturday afternoon, we go for a walk. Well, it's pouring with rain, isn't it? In spite of being Eastbourne, it's pouring with rain. <laughs> And so the pastor said, let's just have an informal meeting. Oh, sit around the, sit around. So we, we all got into this lounge and we're sitting on the floor and the backs of things. And, and he said, we'll just talk. We'll just talk about one another, to one another. Okay, so he's sitting there, so I'm sitting there. Okay. He said, Terry, what's happened to you? I said, what? He said, something's happened to you. What's happened to you? I thought, oh boy, here we go. I've been to the Pentecostals. I speak in tongues. No, I didn't say it quite like that. I told them as carefully as I knew how what had happened. And this dear godly man who built a substantial church, he said, you must lay hands on all these young people and I'll come at the end of the queue. He said that in front of all of them. And I had the joy over the next few weeks to lay hands on lots of them and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And from that time on, that, that all through that summer, on Sunday afternoons, we went down to the fish market. And some of the girls who could play guitars, played their guitars. I stood on a box and preached the gospel at that place where I thought, I could never do that in my life. The Holy Spirit had come. He set us alive. He changed everything for us. The Spirit came upon us. So, beloved, you know, I'm not talking about this just as a history book or even as a Bible study. I'm trying to help us see. See, I find faith comes from the Word. And I guess over the years now, many years, I've laid hands, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people, but I would always take them through the Word first, always. Someone says, will you pray for me? I say, have you got time? I want to take you through the Bible. Because we just need to see what the Bible says. And I've been showing you what the Bible says. Which should say, well, it's for me then. If you put your faith in Jesus, you know you're a Christian, then you're a candidate. Now, many of us here will say, well, this already happened to me. Some of us may say, well, that's never happened to me. I'd like us to pray for you this morning, if you'd like to be, if you'd like to pray. Jesus says, if anyone's thirsty, if anyone's thirsty, he doesn't say, if anyone is specially holy, he doesn't say that. It's just as if anyone's thirsty. I was thirsty. I was thirsty. I wanted what God had for me. If anyone's thirsty, come to me and drink. See, when I was in that room, I, I went there, but the big man's going to do it for me. Well, the big man came and prayed, but, and then he went. And I, I think what happened, beloved, was this. In that moment, I got my eyes off God to the big man. Oh, he's going to do it for me. I know, I'll sit there and he'll do it to me. 
I took on, can I put this right? Passive mode. I waited. When the guy spoke to me, they said, now come on. And I, and I, I had to kind of respond. Speaking in tongues, it doesn't hit you in the back of the neck. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, that'd be pretty scary. It'd be pretty scary. Now you do it. They spoke in tongues. The Spirit gave them the utterance. I believe it's a bit like, you remember that other Elisha story, which I read yesterday in my devotional reading? He said, there's a widow and she's run out of money. And he says, how much oil have you got? Well, I've got this much. Get as many vessels as you can. So she gets as many vessels as she can. Then he says, pour it into all of them. Or actually just said, pour it. <laughs> and this was the miracle, beloved. This was the miracle. It wasn't, wow, look at that oil, but wow, look at it go. No, no, no. She poured what she had. The miracle was this. It didn't stop. That was the miracle. She began to pour and it didn't stop. Tongues is like that. It doesn't suddenly hit you. He we begin to speak and it doesn't stop. It keeps coming, it keeps coming. That's what she did. She began to pour and it kept coming. So we don't take passive mode saying, he'll do it for me. It's a bit like Jesus. When Jesus is walking on the storm and Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come to you. Jesus says, come. Well, then he's sitting on the boat thinking, oh, was that it? No, that wasn't it. What was that? He's, he's got to walk off the boat. He's not waiting. Jesus said, come. But he's never walked on water before. Jesus said, come. So what did he do? He used his walking apparatus. Walked to the end of the boat and then kept walking. And he walked. He walked right out to where Jesus was. It was just at hand. When you speak in tongues, your mind doesn't know what you're saying. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, your brain doesn't understand it. So you're not speaking into your ear. I think, what am I saying? It's irrelevant. You speak to God and you just begin to speak. And then you find, hey, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Over the years, I don't know how many different tongues I've had. I don't think it's the same as the one I started with. And sometimes in a public meeting, I find another tongue comes to me. So, but you just begin to speak. You begin to speak. The Spirit comes upon us. Now this is, I mean, I've talked about a book called The Spirit-Filled Church. There's a whole life in the Spirit. You know, prophesying, healing, what has God got? Words of knowledge, wisdom, wow. A corporate life in the Spirit. But for each one of us, we need to be initiated, baptized into baptized in the Spirit. I think that's the first filling. We can get many fillings, but you get baptized into that dimension, your first time. Would you like to stand, please? Holy Spirit, we just ask you to help us right now. Help us right now. Help each individual. Thank you, Father. Now, last Sunday afternoon, I tried to help a few people um, to be ready to pray for others. And if, if uh, you're ready to take part and help me, and maybe I'll have spoken to you, I don't know, but if you would like to be involved uh, to pray for people, would you like to slip, slip forward now, please? Would you come forward, those who are willing to pray for other people? Would you come, please? And just line up right across, please, right over from here. Not all together, that would be not good. Over there, spread out as far as we can. Spread out as far as we can. Right out, right to the window if need be. Right to the wall. Okay. So now, if you, if you would like to be prayed for, I'll give a bit more instruction right before we start praying. But if you'd like to be prayed for and you've never, and you've never received the Spirit, or I'm not talking about, oh, I received back in 10 years ago, I'd love to new, no, no, I'm talking to people who've never, this is new to you, like it was new to Paul, like it was new to the Samaritans, this is new to you. We'd like to pray for you if you'd like to be prayed for. So if you'd like to pray for, would you like to just uh, step forward, please? And just
just come up to one or two of these people. Just come forward if you'd like to be prayed for. Could you just, could you just play some music, please? Just come, we'll wait for you. If you'd like to be prayed for. We're not going to make an exhibition of you, I promise. We're not here to shake you. We're certainly not here to push you around. We just want to help if we can. If you'd like to be prayed for, please come. That's right, that's right. Just wait a while. I'm going to just say a few more words. We won't be long. It's not going to take a long, long time. You don't get that in picture from the Bible. Just long enough to serve you. Okay? That's right. Just find your way. Now, I'm going to pray, and then when I finish praying, I'd like you just to... Would you like to then come to Jesus, and it says, if you, being evil, that's us, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? All right, so in a moment, I'd like to encourage you to ask. All right, please listen to me. Just come and ask. Would you do that? Let's just do that right before that. Right? Just come before Lord Jesus. Please would you give me the Holy Spirit. Would you do that? Just say, Father, please would you give me the Holy Spirit. According to your word, please would you give me the Holy Spirit. I come to drink. I come to drink. I come to take. Now just lay hands on them, dear friends. Just lay hands on them and pray. Holy Spirit, just come upon these now. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and fill. Come and fill. Come and fill. And then just take, just take as you receive what God's promised to give, because he said drink. And just begin to think, speak out. Maybe those who are praying might want to pray in tongues as you're praying for people. You just join in. There's no technique, but just come. That's right. Just thank God. Let's thank God. Those of us in the hall who say, well, I've had this experience. Would you pray for them? Just pray where you are. Pray for these who've come. Let's all call on God together. Lord Jesus, bless these who've come. Raise our voices. Pray for them. Holy Spirit, come upon them.